let's get into it. So for today's Divine Sacred Dialogue, I'm actually going to be speaking with one of my really good friends, Devin, who is an activist in the state of Florida. Devin has been an activist for over a decade and she has worked in legislative advocacy as well as political campaigns. I think that having this conversation with Devin is divine in more than one way, but especially because this conversation comes on the heels of the violent deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. I'm hoping that you know you all can leave this dialogue with an understanding that the activism is not dead. It didn't die in the 60s after the civil rights movement. It's here, it's alive, and I couldn't think of a better person to have this conversation with than someone who is on the ground doing the work. She is in these grassroots organization and she's making things happen not only for people of color, but just people in general. Because as we all know, white supremacy not only takes away the lives of people due to things that they have no control over, but it also strips white people of their humanity as well. So just waiting for Devin to come on. She got she got you me, y'all, red lips. Hey Devin. Girl, I had to come with it today. <laughs> yes. I'm good. How are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling it. I know. Yeah. And I didn't even get I don't have the Kleenex next to me today, but thank you <laughs> so much for doing this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you for it just I I just appreciate you so much um for one oh. even having these sacred dialogues every Thursday and just at a time where like we really need these types of dialogues for us. Mm -hmm. Um I see you and I just want to appreciate you for that. Um and then just also as a friend, I know it's been a while since we've connected and like you were my first friend. Um, and so I just thank you for, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I, thank I, you just for even thinking that. about me. <laughs> I know, girl, we go back away. We go back a ways. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, there's more I can say, but just thank you, Paulietta. Like I see you and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to chat after this, but I just, thank you. That, that meant a lot. <laughs> so I was giving the people um, an introduction, you know, about just your work, Devin, and just saying how I couldn't think of a better person to actually have this conversation with someone who has been so dedicated in the fight for, you know, equal rights and beyond that equity. Okay, because there is a difference. And just to yeah. see the way you have blossomed in this work is just phenomenal. And knowing that this isn't it, you know, you have a lot of other stuff that you're gifted about. And so, you know, we're going to talk about that later in the conversation. But I just really want you to, you know, talk about your journey. How did you actually get into activism? Because childhood Devin was supposed to be Dr. Cheese. <laughs> So how, and I'm talking about medical doctor, y'all, not PhD, yes. you know, like, so how did you, you know, find your way on this path of fighting for other people's rights? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad you started with Childhood Devin, because that's actually, when I talk about activism, I can't not start there. Um, and I know, like, we come from both girls from home uh, from Palmetto, Florida, mm -hmm. right? And just knowing that we had a lot of old heads that taught the importance of paying it forward. Um, yeah. Even the with the advocacy, it was different. Um, it was just like, this is about ours and us. And um, I always look to that as like the foundation for all of my organizing and activist work is looking at folks in Palmetto, like uh, Miss Shannon and Miss Mays and like all of these old heads and uh, coach, um, I can't think of, uh, I see his face right now, but like these first who were the first to integrate yeah. Lincoln Memorial back in the day. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Miss Barbara Harvey and <laughs> Lynette oh Edwards God. and, you know, all these folks, right? Um, so I look to that as like the foundation and learning how to like serve others through again groups like Delta Gems. I wasn't I was a part of Delta Gems, but there was Precious Pearls, Arcanets, like those that's that was that foundation. And then going to Florida State, you know, that was where Devin childhood Devin was like, okay, I can really flourish and be and and figure out who I am 
outside of my family, right? Because Palmetto yeah. Manatee County is such a small place and then getting even more politically engaged. Uh, 2008 was the first time I voted because, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, of course, I was eligible to vote. And that was also a very critical election. It was the election of Barack Obama, right? right. Um, and then being at Florida State and uh, was still pre-med, but also like things were happening. Didn't have the language, but it was like, I'm going to be active because that was that foundation I came from. So I joined the NAACP at Florida State and was active with that chapter um, <clears throat> and just other things that were happening. And so came home, graduated and was like, oh, what do I do? Now I'm getting involved in uh, political organizing again in 2012 um, and so like I look at these as stepping stones of like each and every step was like a little bit further and 2012 was also another critical year because it was not only like uh, the year that I started politically organizing like I, I joined the campaign for Obama but it was also the same year that um, and I don't know if you went to school with Rodney Mitchell like that was I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's because I know we, like, between Lincoln and Hale and, like, all, you know, busing and whatnot, we all went to different schools, but we were still in the same community. But right. Rodney Mitchell was killed that summer. And I remember being, like, reading the news and just seeing all of these things and how they were, like, saying that he was trying to run cops over. And I'm like, but that's not Rodney. Like, mm -hmm. there was just something that didn't add up. And even seeing the outrage on Facebook where it's like, this don't make sense. This don't make sense. This not adding up. Um, and then to fast forward two years from that point and Michael Brown happens. Yeah. And then that's where, of course, uh, and in, in that time, because not only did Bonnie Mitchell happen in 2012, that was also when Trayvon Martin was murdered, right? So you have all of these moments that are mm -hmm. happening at the same time. And it's just like, what what's going on? It's like kind of Krusty Krab me a little bit. And then I feel like 2014 was the year that I was able to find language through the movement around like this uh, this phenomenon that happens when black people are killed and the media goes on like their whole history of whatever they've done wrong in their entire lives is like character assassination and that's intentional, yeah. right? Um, and then this is like, oh, that's what that's why that didn't make sense about Rodney because like that wasn't who he was, but that fit the narrative to be able to justify his death. And so, Whew. Um, yeah, 2014 was like, oh no, you, uh, the, the puzzle started to be a lot clearer. Mm -hmm. And what was also pivotal about that year is I found other folks who looked like me, who were black, brown, queer in my area who were like, we got to do something about it. And I remember it was August 2014, and I, I even have a picture of it. And my friend, one of my best friends actually, who's running for office in South Florida, her name's Jasmine Roger Shaw. She was living in Northport at the time, and I was living in Palmetto, and I was like, this, this protest is happening in St. Pete. We got to go. This was, again, right at, in response to Michael Brown um, being assassinated. And that was, like, the beginning of the, like, radicalization of my, like, activism, I would say. That's when I started having the terms. And then through that experience, be, uh, actually joined Dream Defenders, which – Long story there, but I actually was uh, tied to Dream Defenders before I actually got into it because I was following and I wanted to be at the Capitol when they were protesting against Trayvon Martin and it's like, couldn't make it up there. And so to come two years later and it's like, here's this opportunity again to join this organization that's doing work. Um, that was where I got the political education to understand like the framework that we use and there's different ones, but the trap and how the trap is designed to trap us of a, our power. You have these institutions like police and prisons, and you have poverty, and you have schools. <laughs> and, and, and like you look at all of the things that are happening in these institutions, and you see how they are designed to strip us of our power, and what are we going to do about it, right? Um, that, was, that was a part of my radicalization, I would say, um, and being able to find, connect the dots even deeper and learn more about the the political history of like my lineage as well. Because I know yeah. my lineage and, but like we kind of strip away the struggles because we don't want to feel that pain, I think sometimes, but it's important for us to know where we came from and to know our, our lineage, our political lineage as well, because black folks have been on the front line since the beginning of time. Um, and so that's how I got into activism in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> Yes.
And you know what? And you bring up two very good points. You know, the fact that we try to separate ourselves from real pain and being able to say we have trauma encoded in our DNA due to violence because we simply reside in a black body. And when you talk about these years, Devin, like I'm getting images in my mind because that's when it started for a lot of us. I remember in 2014 being in the West Indies and having an intense conversation about being an American, you know, and so I'm on like my whole like patriotic period, like, but America's this, and I was just like, and next thing I know, boom, you know, Mike Brown. And I was like, I just was having this conversation an hour ago. And I said, now I'm being forced to face the realization you are advocating for a country that has never advocated for you. Mm. And thank God nobody said I told you so. But, you know, being 24 years old and we were so angry, like, because if we were hit, boom, like this is stuff that has always happened to us. And now what are we going to do? And I remember coming straight back from St. Lucia and picking up a sign and marching in downtown Atlanta, you know, for Mike Brown. And so, my gosh, yeah, um, I feel you there. Like, and it's, it was so vivid, you giving us that chronology, the, the timeline of these events. So when you talk about, you know, your advocacy, your activism and everything, how much does your positionality play a part? When I talk about your positionality, you know, being black, being a woman, being queer, being from, you know, a small southern town where we were side by side with people that really wanted nothing to do with us, that was our normal, you know. How has this influenced the other issues, social issues that you've taken up? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Um, whew, yeah, it's informed a lot. Um, and I'll have to say those identities, like, it took some time for me to feel, to, to really take ownership of them. You know, particularly talking about my queerness, um, and particularly, yeah, definitely talking about my queerness and even my blackness. Like you say, like we grew up in a town where it was a lot of gaslighting and a lot, it was just, it was just a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And to be able to still move with, from a place of love and compassion and even understanding, like breaking it down. Like we come from a rural area and yes, we were alongside some folks who really didn't like us and who called us all sorts of names, but they were also poor too. Mm -hmm. um, they were also, you know, disabled or also like these other things. And so I feel like my identities and those, 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 that, that, that positionality that I have allows me to be able to see more clearly one that a lot of the things that we're fighting for, the things that we're talking about, the things that we need are ultimately intertwined together. Like we, like they, at the, at the root, like they, you can't, you can separate them, but ultimately at the root, they're, they're, it's all about sort of, it's all about the person. It's, it's um, how do you be your, the fullest version of yourself? And so I think that those identities allow me to be able to connect with folks in a way that I wouldn't, um, that wouldn't be as accessible to me. And I, and again, that's like a work in progress because the more that I am learning and knowing and trusting myself, the more I'm like working with my body and, and just, uncovering things <clears throat> and and just yeah just doing that self-work it things become a lot more clear and I don't know if I'm making perfect sense here I it let me know if I need to clarify um but I think that that positionality uh is important because we are not just I'm not just a black woman like I'm not just mm -hmm. a, I'm not just a queer person I'm not just a you know like those all of those make up who I am um, and I think the more that we have that approach of bringing our full selves into the space, I'm rural, right? So like, yeah, like I'm black and I'm queer and I'm femme, and, but I'm also from the rural South. And mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I said South with an F. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <just> came out. <laughs> um, you know, and so I, and I have love for my people. I love Palmetto, um, you know, and, and even just knowing about my family, like I have members of my family who don't look like me you know, through mm -hmm. marriage or what have you. And so 
I think that that positionality of having those multiple identities allows me to move with inter move uh, through intersections and be able to connect with folks and really like bring us back in and build true solidarity because ultimately like my fight is in your fight or what have you, but it is our fight because it ultimately is still, we're all being attacked by the same thing. If that makes right. sense. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely makes sense because we all are residing in these systems of oppression together. Right. And so, <laughs> right. And so while it might be somebody who is currently being overt and they're othering and also they hold the position of power, what, how we engage with it, what we do with it, that really influences who we become and what happens to our next generations. And so are we going to build generations of fear? Are we going to build generations of hatred? And so that can really only happen by having dialogues across the table. Mm -hmm. So with, with, I will say with respect, because I, you know, <laughs> that's the in doing that's this the work, because um, I've, I've, I've talked to people across the aisles who will look you in the face and will still not see your dignity. And that is so hard. Mm -hmm. That is so hard to still look at that person and not want to do something, you know, like to get them to feel. Because uh, right. I think I recognize that as a numbness. Like you still look at me in my eye and still not seeing my dignity is, you know. So I think within reason, we do have to have these dialogues. Um, and I think that we do have folks, because um, I, I, I will just be careful and say, like, especially for Black folks, I'm just going to advocate, like, it's, uh, if you got some accomplices, like, I mean, I'm talking about in terms of, like, whatever the intersection, if it's race, if it's, uh, if you have, like, uh, a, um, whatever that, whatever that, that, whatever it is, um, if you mm -hmm. have an accomplice that can speak to that. I, I just find that helpful in times like this because like uh, dialogue right now with folks who are um, still kind of asking questions around like Amy Cooper and, and you know, just, just certain dialogues. I, I'm realizing I don't actually have the energy for right now to hold that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know I have some accomplices, some, some of my white folks who can hold those conversations, you know, and so I appreciate them for being able to lean into that work because I want to hold my folks right now, you know? Um, so I think they'll, and, and that's a dialogue too, right? Even being able to, to yeah. be, be in solidarity with other folks and be like, Hey, we got to focus on us right now. Can y'all get y'all people? And that be principled enough to be like, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going to do that work. So dialogue is really important. Um, and it, and, and especially principled, um, which is hard, but is necessary. Yeah. And I think that's something that people don't often think about. You know, we hear, you know, the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup, but people don't even look at their energy as being something that can either fill up a cup or it can be depleted. Right. And that was a conversation I was actually having earlier with one of my coworkers because we work in a predominantly white setting. And I was saying, I said, you know what, I'm so grateful to, even if I have to be in a setting where it looks very much like this, I am not being forced to open up wounds that have yet to heal by seeing yes. people look like me be killed in the street. And that's really important. But even if someone was to ask me that question, I was prepared to tell them, I'm not in a place to have that discussion, nor do I want to be a spokesperson, you know, yeah. for my race at this time. And a lot of that has to do with honesty. And I consider, you know, us being able to voice our concerns and also our grief, you know, that has a lot to do with the throat chakra. And so, okay, it will clog <laughs> up on you. And so, you know, we talk about sacredness, like, being in your truth, that's sacred. Like, if you can't say this is who I am, even if who I am right now ain't shit, then how can you go forth and really help people? You know, how can you be a blessing to yourself? So, you know, so how do you balance that? Um, for those of you who do not know, Devin is not only a divine activist, she is also a yoga instructor from time to time. She's an avid gardener. And so... How do you bring those different things into your practice, you know, to help you stay grounded in the work that you're doing? Ooh, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, it's hard 
Um, but yeah, I like even today, today was I actually had to take a nap before this. <laughs> it was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna go to sleep. That's definitely a resilience practice and helps me. Um, and it has been since I was a child when things just get too much or overwhelming, it's like Ooh. my body will literally like go to sleep. Just go to sleep and I'll wake up so much better. But yoga has been so transformational for me. And I, and I was so fortunate to be able to learn through um, through a movement leader. Her name is Linda Berman. And like, so if you don't know who Linda Berman is, definitely look her up. This is a black okay. woman, old head. Um, and she, we had the sisters retreat for like movement leaders and she was, she led us through yoga. And it was like the first time I felt like my body actually took a breath. And mm -hmm. my mama like jokes all the time. She's like, you, uh, did you even breathe when you just talked just then? Like you just talking don't see just don't breathe so yoga has actually helped me get in touch with that and recognize things in my body um and just have a greater appreciation for the strength within and like the things that I do hold in like it's so when you talked about the throat chakra like literally even this morning like I woke up at four o'clock this morning realizing like my throat and the, the ball like the just the weight that I felt in my chest mm -hmm. and in my throat and I immediately was like I need to move I need to do some yoga I need to like do some breath work and actually like lion's breath, <sighs> blow it out, like get right. that blockage out. <laughs> right, right. Because um, it's like we do, we we internalize a lot of the pain and we don't say it. And that, and when you said that earlier about how this is in our genes, like epigenetics, trauma, that stuff is in our genes. I look at my parents, right? My mom who has high blood pressure and heart problems, her mama had heart problems, her mama had heart problems like the, in our genes, right? Um, and I think about my dad and the stress that he has. And then I think about my granddad. So I got into gardening because my granddad, my dad's dad, actually both both sides of my family were sharecroppers. Um, but I knew my granddad was. And he was so good. Um, Teresia, you know, Teresia right side, outside of Palmetto. He was so good. They apparently mm -hmm. gave him land to grow more. Oh. Uh, I didn't, I want to get more information because I didn't even realize you know uh he grew you know Terracia is like right now is mostly white folks there um but mm -hmm. uh, the, the Grove Atwood Grove and to know that our family still lives down the street from where the Grove was which is mm -hmm. like you know mind-blowing to me but just being able to get back into that practice of gardening and getting in with the soil and like just taking care of the earth um the way that our people did and growing our own food like my granddaddy had the saying, can't bend dead. And that basically means like, there's nothing you can't do. Like self-determination, that's that's the way of our people. So we grew our own food. We did what we had to do to survive. And we, we were resilient in doing so. And so when I look at gardening, and this is something I wanted to do for years, I'm so grateful. I, I shouldn't even be talking without like giving a shout out to Chardonnay Singleton. Like, uh, I love her so much. Um, and she was helpful in helping me get my garden started because I've been talking for years about starting this garden. Um, other practices that I do um, as well is like singing. I've been coming back to singing. I used to sing when I was a kid. Yeah. And yeah, uh, it's like, okay, I need to do that more because music, song, I love music. I love to sing. I love to dance. Um, and it is cathartic and it makes sense even looking at my mom and my dad in particular I remember he would sometimes walk around the house and just start singing hymns and just yeah just shout yeah you know and it's like I get it now like that's that's releasing that another yeah. blockage is using that throat chakra um, the you know just just the and then sound therapy of course when you're singing right like you're yeah. actually healing yourself in real time so those are a few things in art of course just drawing and colors um just creating creating like things that have to do with our hands and um our bodies like being fully into it those practices for me help me get more in tune with my feelings and what's going mm -hmm. on with me and also helps me realize the power that i hold within me to be able yeah. to do these things which is which Rip, like sends you know ripple effects right it, it's contagious it, it, it packs people in real time um so yeah those resilience practices I feel like lately and I have to also credit um emergent strategy 
by Adrian Marie Brown is a really, really good book. And she talks about like, <laughs> she talks about resilience practices as well. Um, I think it's also, I haven't finished Pleasure Activism. That's another book that she wrote. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's important for us because with everything that is happening right now, and I have to say it, like, there is a clear strategy that is happening and has been happening for centuries that is designed to strip us of our ashe, of our power, of, like mm -hmm. to get attracted. Mm -hmm. And so when we practice those resilience practices like yoga, gardening, art, singing, dancing, movement, whatever it is, like that is literally, that's how we pour back into ourselves and we're able to keep moving and keeping on, keeping on because that's what our people did, right? <laughs> like, and that's why, you know, it, 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 some people may even look at it as like, oh, like how could you be so happy? And it's just like, because I know from where my joy comes from, like I know where that, that mm -hmm. you can't give that to me. Um, so, ooh, I'm saying that now. I was like reminding myself, make sure you do your resilience practice. <laughs> it is oh. so important. It is so important. You will burn out if you don't. And I, ooh, honey, don't burn out. We cannot afford any more burnouts. We can't afford yeah. any more martyrs right now. Ooh, Devin, <laughs> you just gave a word. <laughs> oh my gosh, you just gave. I'm like, I had to fan myself with my notebook because yeah, I was looking I'm for five. <laughs> let's stand together like oh my gosh because as you were talking I was already thinking she's just getting back to the source you're getting back to that good old continental soil oh. that had us troop through the transatlantic slave trade from the 15th century until the 19th century. And you're talking about music and you're talking about creativity and movement. Girl, if we can get back to that, you know, um, when I was living now, you know, Devin, you've been down in Miami quite a bit. So you mm -hmm. already know that's a pretty spiritual situation on yeah. many different spiritual forms, but really oh, yeah. they're, they all family. And so I remember talking with one of my colleagues when I was in grad school, and he is a part of IFA. Um, mm -hmm. IFA is a Yoruba tradition for anyone who doesn't know um, in Nigeria, what is now modern-day Nigeria. And so he was talking about, you know, all the things that have been happening, because at this time, this is when the veil was lifted. Now the veil has been torn away. But... Yeah. You know, and I remember telling him, I said, honestly, what we need to do, especially as black people, we need to just join hands and sing. Like, we have forgotten our voices. Yes. We need to sing. I said, y'all want to see some radical transformation go down? Listen. Grab hands. Grab hands and get out there where the dead know how to commune. And Ooh. then we will start to see some stuff come down. Y'all, yes. okay, y'all. No, girl, no, keep going, keep going. <laughs> you just said it. Go ahead and move. Because my thing is everybody thinks that these systems are going to fall due to respectability politics. They were killing our people in the street when they had on suits and ties. I was about to just say Martin was in a suit. Malcolm was in a suit. Like, these people were respectable people who talked the talk and walked the walk. And still, it wasn't enough. Like, we see that time and time and time again. And even just recently with the brother who, uh, the Christian Cooper, I think is his name. And it was like, oh, he's Harvard. That don't mean nothing. He would have still right. died if it wasn't for, you know, his ancestors. I don't know. If it wasn't, if, if he could, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Respectability will not save us. It will not. No. Right. And it's never done anything for us. What it did was it kept us in boxes and it kept us separated from the people who were in these rural areas. You know, like we both have families that were sharecroppers, okay? I right. was like, listen, I was like, we weren't talented 10 until we was talented 10, okay? I was okay. like, we, we was at the bottom. And so, 
You know what I'm saying? And so it kept us separated. Like, you know, it kept us from being able to say, yeah. listen, I have the education and I have the correct tone of voice, but also you've been out here twirling in the sand. Let's work together so that we can get out of this. We could have left the cotton fields much sooner if we wouldn't have relied on respectability politics because these were the same people telling you how to speak, how to show up, how to be, how to yeah. respond when yeah. all they ever did was react. Yep. Yep. So <laughs> you get right. the girl. You just you just getting back to where you needed to be. And I'm so happy to know that activism looks like you. Okay? Activism isn't always showing up, you know, but enough. We do that too, because we, and we do it well or whatever, because we also still in some ways have, we're a part of that culture of respectability politics. We might be the last generation that has really absorbed that knowledge. These you, younger kids coming up, they don't care about anything. Oh, they like, I said what I said. You know what Listen, and I'm for it. Gen Z, I'd be like, you go off, baby. Like, I, I'm just like, you say the things I wish I had the language for back then. But you know what? And those, we have to protect them. Kids. We have, not kids, because not all of them are kids. We have to protect mm -hmm. them, especially the children, because children be knowing they are, their, their connection to God is almost like, direct like literally direct we got to protect the babies we definitely got to protect those kids and the people the young gen z folks who are speaking truth to power with no apology because those th th that's the torch that's that's who we're passing the torch on to and this this is how we continue to build that generational wealth that we talk about for you know mm -hmm. and, and just, we have to keep doing that we do especially because children have just come back from a spiritual realm you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like yes. Yeah, they have a closeness with God that even those of us like we're we're away from, and we have a more of a connection with a close. I don't want to say connection, but we have more, I guess, of an intimacy of knowing how God works, even than our parents, because yes. you know, we're, yeah, I was just like we thirty five, forty years, you know, away, whereas they're sixty five, sixty six, and you know, higher away from them. At least our parents, because you know, we have older folks. Thank God for the older mama and daddy, though grateful for it um <laughs> so for sure protect the young ones you know because they also help nourish that childlike spirit in us kids have an yes, intuition that's yes. out of this world and we have denied ourselves that intuition which is also why we found ourselves in some of this mess we keep thinking that these people are going to see our humanity well they maybe they don't, they don't. At this point, and even the even the folks who are ign who are you know, un there there are very to me I there's two folks. There are folks who don't want to get it, and you know those folks. There are folks mm -hmm. who don't get it because they are in their bubble. It's also at this point, it's like it's not even personal to you, you and your bubble. But if you can't see it at this point, that is legit your problem. You got to fix that, honey, because Molly, you is in danger, girl. Like <laughs> at this point, you is in danger. If mm -hmm. you cannot see what is around you, if you cannot feel what is around you, the people that live in your neighborhood who don't look like you, but who are still your neighbors, if you can't see what's going on around you, you don't want to see. And you got to sit with that and ask questions. But I feel like there, yeah, I just had to say that. Like, there's there's, there's two people. Like, there's those, there's those folks. But both of them, honestly, at the end of the day, it's like, they're still dangerous. It's still, life, yeah. life still gets snuffed out just because even if you aren't intentionally quote unquote racist though I'm not gonna get on that I'm not gonna get on that uh subject because anyways but even if you don't think you are like <laughs> yeah if, if you aren't just connected with your everyday what's around you and you think the world revolves around you you're part of the problem and and this time is different I will say as someone who's been out in the streets this this particular moment is different and that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, well, I was going to ask you what made it different, but that might be part two. <laughs> well, I think I'll, 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 I'll indulge a little bit because I feel like okay. I didn't know it's different for me, right? Because I <clears> – so the, the full disclosure, I – um. in my faith, uh, I have – I've been um, – I'm in, newly initiated into Ifa myself um, and okay. have found that to be a home – for me, it's, it's, 
that's that's a part of my transformation and why I'm able to even show up right now and be able to speak truth to power in the way that I am right now. Um, and I think that having a deeper connection with my ancestors through, and, I, and not necessarily through E5, but because I did, was doing that before E5, and through E5 is definitely intensified, and being able to have like a a renewed sense of faith and understanding and clarity and intuition. That's why I say this moment is different. Um, I say it's different because my sister called me. Uh, both of them actually mm -hmm. called me and was like, I don't know how you do this every day. I, I paid attention for 24 hours and I'm beside myself. I'm having conversations with my mom and dad who are now starting to actually voice the things that we've never said and named before, they're starting to say and name. They're talking about their lived experiences. And, you know, my mama even said, she was like, I was hoping that things would be different. Like, I wanted different for y'all. She actually was able to articulate that. Yeah. And, and, and it gives some understanding to, like, you know, even the way that we kind of pacified ourselves and tried to just focus on, you know, kind of in some way spiritually bypassing a lot of the trauma and stuff that was happening to us. But we're mm -hmm. coming to a moment where now we realize we can't spiritually bypass this moment because it is literally, like, it's stripping us. Um, we can't spiritually bypass this moment. And so I, that's why I say this moment is different because people – my family, like I've seen, even my brother, I saw I, my heart like literally tore in two, you know, because I like my brother is like as a man of few words, and he writing on Facebook saying that this don't make no sense, and his wife is, mm -hmm. you know, so I that's why I say this is different. My cousin is just like ten toes down. I wish somebody would. This moment is different. People who I grew up in church with, yeah, this moment is different. Um, yeah, I, I, I see it and I, and I, Ooh, I don't know. I pray for a different, I pray for change. I also know that change looks, there's, there's a lot that can come with change. And so I, I hold space for that because, Ooh, yeah. Um, everybody doesn't make it through the change. Yeah. And, and Change isn't linear, you right. know. I don't think people, when, when we ask for change, when we say that we want equality, what are you willing to give up? Right. And in the same way, you know, that our ancestors who were activists, they, a lot of them gave up their lives. You know, it's just like, what in this life that you feel fulfills your life are you willing to give up? Right. And I don't think spirit wants us to rest. I, I think that we've been resting for far too long. And that's why we're seeing so many things. And I just feel like all these conversations, they're happening simultaneously. And they're all in divine order. Because even, you know, my mom was talking about going to a gun range. My grandmother. And I'm mm -hmm. like, huh? Look. you know, so that calls me to be even more accountable. I was just like, okay, we have these older women. They ready to strap up, Paulietta. You know, you, you, you not need to consider some things yourself. Okay. Because these are the times that we've been preparing for, you know, and, oh, my gosh, that's just, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's a fear in me when it comes to that, you know, because. I feel you. Yeah, because who, who am I going to be, you know, on that battleground? You know, I've taken more of an um, academic approach to how I have engaged white supremacy. You know, going to school to be able to learn the language of how mm -hmm. to talk about these types of things. And, you know, having a social media presence. And, but... How am I called to even speak even more with, like, a militant, you know, when I write things and, you know, when I'm in these spaces where people are having, you know, like, they're spewing educated jargon. 
And mm, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a tactic too, sis, though. That's a tactic. Like the work that you're doing is a tactic. We need multiple, listen, like strategy is a, what does it mean? Um, oh, all of it is coming. Strategy and tactics are, are military terms. And so I feel like we have the strategy. We know the strategy is liberation. Your, your, the work that you're doing and being able to talk about critical race theory is important and is a tactic at demolishing this dominant culture that is everything that we're fighting against. That's, that's the root. That's mm-hmm. the core. Another name for it is white supremacy. But I like dominant culture because, like, it's, it is dominant. It's so dominant. It's, it's not just white folks who are, who are subscribing to that. Their strategy is so good that some of us are even regurgitating the same thinking and the same things. And so sure. it's dominant culture, you know, like how do we catch that and, and be able to, to use the tools that we have to be able to, to get towards liberation. It's like that quote, and I, there's so many quotes in my head and I'm probably going, <laughs> I'm probably going to say Asada Shakur said something Audre Lorde said, but, <laughs> but okay. like you, can't build the, you can't build with the master's tools. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. Like what do we? What do? What do we? How do we? How do we strategize and use our tactics in a way? Because there is no one tactic that's greater than the other. We need to use uh-huh. all of them together to be able to demolish this big thing that is white supremacy dominant culture. So, I just want to say, all of it is the work. Yeah, and you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about Foucault. Like Foucault talks a lot about power dynamics. Foucault was, you know. Uh, old white man scholar but you know when he brings up power dynamics he also talks about how you know depending on the context you know temporality the time it changes because now it brings in well who's holding the power in this particular situation and so while we see obviously over cases of white people holding dominance you know oftentimes inciting it on people of color also within people of color, our faces, you know, particularly black people, it's just like, what does that look like? You know, there are power dynamics between sexuality, power dynamics between, you know, colorism, you know, who's dark enough to lead the cause, but not to, you know, just all these type of things that come into play. And so do you think of your activism as sacred? And yes. if you do think of your activism as sacred, in what ways do you find it to be sacred? <clears throat> yes, yes, my activism is definitely sacred. Um, there is a quote. Oh, I should know. Um, there is a organization in Georgia by the name of Southerners on New Ground. Uh, Mary Hooks is one of the folks on the ground with Song. They go by Song. And Mm -hmm. she's a brilliant Black woman uh, who uh, get just brilliant. And she has this mandate that's the mandate for Black folks. Um, Oh, it's it's because it's it's so much in my head. But the last part is avenging the the suffering of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So when I think of my activism, like... It's sacred because, yes, I am avenging the suffering of my ancestors in righting the wrongs that they had to endure and being able to have the tools and the understanding and 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 and, and their support, by the way, too, because I don't not talk to my people. <laughs> I got to mm-hmm. talk to my ancestors. So that is what's sacred also because I am literally fighting for my life and livelihood and my, and pe- and my people. That is sacred. Like it is our birthright to be to have joy and pleasure and all of the in abundance. That's our birthright. And so, yes, it is sacred that the activism that I'm fighting for is like I just want to be the best version of myself. And who the hell are you to tell me I can't or to strip that mm-hmm. from me? Like, no, that is sacred. And then even further, so I'm kind of doing past, present, future. But like, I want to be a mother. I know I want to have children, whether that's adopting or um, if, if, if I am the vessel to carry, then I will be the vessel to carry. But I know I want to have children and I know I want to have grandchildren. I, I want to be that grandmama on the porch. That's, you know, <laughs> I, I aspire to be that. <laughs> so Same. I, it is absolutely <laughs> sacred. 
what I'm doing right now is like I'm avenging my ancestors because they they they've been yeah like they're stirring all of us up whether we realize it or not it's like all y'all it's like that meme from uh, Bad Girls Club the Tanisha y'all ain't gonna get no sleep because uh, you know she's banging the pot to right. that's how I feel sometimes when I get up at three in the morning I'm like why am I up at three in the morning oh, okay yeah let me um this is on my heart okay bet um and then yeah like we're this is very sacred activism is sacred which is why we have to practice resilience Mm -hmm. Right. Because like, again, if we don't, we will burn out like this is a marathon, right? To quote Nipsey Hussle, the marathon continues quite literally. Um, and so like, it is sacred for us to be able to speak truth to power, to be able to be in community with one another and fight for each other. Right. Like interdependence is has always been our way. Individualism is not natural to us. Right. <laughs> I just want to say that that's not our that's not our shit. OK, we got to let that go. That me, myself and I think that was never where we was about. Tulsa yeah. Rosewood would never have been if it was individualism. It was always about interdependence. OK, so like it is sacred <laughs> that we do this work and that we pass this on to our children. Right. And I think that like you know, just to kind of think about, and not judgment too, I, I, I understand, like I have, I, I'm able to understand, like, because I think about what happened between the civil rights era and now, like, you know, there was a little bit of like, we got comfortable, I think. Yeah. Um, we got a little comfortable. It's like, okay, we got this, we good. And, 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 you know, um, it wasn't good. Right. Uh, but it was good enough to get us here to this point, but mm -hmm. it's, it, you cannot continue um, to just be complacent. So, yeah, um, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> it's sacred. I mean, it's absolutely sacred. Yeah. I mean, you can continue, too, because it's like there's no ending to sacredness. You know, you're as sacred as you want to be. Yeah, you're sacred as much as you put the work into it. And it's true. We have always been a people that believed in kinship and right. community. And it's very much, you know, like what you touched on, you know, the historian coming out. That is a very new world idea, individualism. Mm -hmm. And individualism is also prioritized because of capitalism as well. Yeah, the three evils. So, exactly. And so we have seen time and time again what happens when we do not know how to lean on each other for support. And I'm not talking about codependency. Right. You know, I love that you said interdependency because that's what it is. If I got it, you got it, okay? Right. right. When I'm down, you're up. And I'm never really down because, you know, I'm just on the shoulder. So I'm just, right. like, you know, I'm just a few inches down and that's okay. Yes. And we have to get back to it. Like everything that you're saying throughout this live, I'm just thinking, get back to source, get yeah. back to source. Cause yes. we, we have, we have lost the ability to love up on each other. Yes. 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 It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility. Exactly. I, it is not our fault because I again that strategy is working. It is working, honey. And it is our responsibility. It is we have to. We have to get back to that. And you know, like I see there's just so much that's happening right now in this moment with you know, I saw somebody on Facebook that was like, Oh, y'all outraged about a white man police officer killing a black person, but we killed blah, blah, blah. I get that. I understand that. But uh -huh. if you understand, I, like, I, I get where they're trying to go with that. But also, like, do you realize that this is, again, a part of a larger strategy that has been in place for yeah. centuries, right? To the point where, like, they literally, I mean, talk about the transatlantic slave trade. Like, they made us walk around a tree for seven times to make us forget where we come from and who we are. Uh -huh. So then you wonder why we sit up here and attacking one another. Like, that that strategy and all of the, all of the, the things the the strat the tactics that they are using through media and all of the things that we consume through music and a lot of things like being mind mindful consumption is real like <clears throat> like no like that's that's it's not our fault and I will I will always fight somebody about that and I will also say at the same time it is our responsibility because at the end of the day we got to get us together we need each other interdependence and so right. I'm kind of like on some Fred Hampton 
uh, stuff now where I'm like, if I see a black person, like, look, I'm not going to call the cops on you, but look here, we ain't going to do this today because we, we need each other. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, I, I don't, I, listen, I, I love you. I don't know what you're struggling with, but honey, we, we can't do this today. We cannot. Exactly. We cannot. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. And we have to be open to receiving constructive criticism from each other, too. Yeah. Because I was like, you know, this is my thing. And I found that to be so frustrating when I lived in Miami. I said, y'all will accept, you know, um, correction from everybody else but other black folks. I wish I had some tea. Wait, I, I'll drink some water. Come on, tea. <laughs> I got my water and my moonshine glass. <laughs> It's alkaline, y'all. Y'all know we like alkaline. <laughs> but tap been good, too. Okay? Don't they got some good tap water back home, Devin? I keep telling you, Manatee County got some good tap water. I didn't <laughs> know. I, listen, in living in Tampa, I was like, dang, I can't. I looked at the water. I said, this ain't, I can't do like home. <laughs> it's not the same. And you it's only talk about a 30 to an hour drive from home. I ain't had no good tap water since I left Manatee County. <laughs> but it, it must be out of oranges. Hey, <laughs> oh bless okay praise god yeah. but you know <laughs> we don't know how to listen to each other and it and it becomes a suppression olympics and what i found living in miami because there were so many different you know um nationalities of black folks that's all it was i had to hear about what happened what people accomplished in 1804 which I appreciate. Shout out to Aidi. But it, but my thing is, we're space. You know, we're experiencing real trauma right now. In this time, I gotta hear about you know what Black Americans have done. I gotta hear about what you know Afro Brazilians have done and everything. And I'm just like y'all. But it's happening to all of us. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. If it can happen in predominantly black countries, you know what I'm saying? It's like, come on. And there was a time when we were able to have a global conversation, you know, with the Harlem Renaissance. Right. Okay. We had that taking place here in America, but we also saw negritude taking place in Latin America, you know, um, negrismo as mm -hmm. well. Like, we saw all this stuff going down, and these people... We're having conversation. Fire was literally sent to Paris. It made its way down to Latin America. It's made its way to the Caribbean. And how did how did we lose that dialogue with each other? Mm. Oof. Yes, that connection. Um, yeah, dominant culture, and I mean, there, I think there's there's multiple. I think there's multiple things, but that's why it's so important to stay connected. And I say this as someone that like, oh, I, you know, I got to practice staying more connected with my folks and with my people. We have to check in on each other more, mm -hmm. um, you know, and even recognizing in that, right? Like it's difficult because we have like bodies of water that separate us. And when you're talking about in a trans, uh, a transatlantic or, or global, transglobal sense, like in terms of building solidarity, but even that, like there's movements that talk about the need to build solidarity across the globe right mm -hmm. um and there are movements like again naming dream defenders who does a lot of work they've done delegations mm -hmm. to like palestine and to brazil and to mm -hmm. uh, you know with building with other movements other grass or i want to say grassroots movement but other popular movements that are um doing that work um and i think it's it's, it's really just staying connected but it's it's harder than it is because you know yeah, um, I don't know. I do know this. That's just one thread, but I I think about that too because, ah, oh, um, I really do believe that that's the reason why. It's like we're not as connected, and not to say that there isn't any connection at all, but it's not as strong as it once was. And so, how do we strengthen the connection to each other? Yeah, you know, to be able to get back to that. Um, understanding again that there are forces that don't want us to be connected, but we know we have to because it's it's sacred. It's for the sake of liberation. Yeah, and I agree. You know, because suffering—that's something that every human can talk yeah. about. 
Absolutely. It's it's not something that solely, even for those of us that are a part of the African diaspora, we know mm -hmm. suffering. Even even saying diaspora, you know what I'm saying? Like we talk a lot about Jewish suffering and everything, but I was like, we can all agree on that. So we can all work together to alleviate it as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's getting darker, you know, on your end and everything. But um, two things before we log off. How can people become more involved with the type of work that you're doing? You know, um, how can they do that in their local areas so that their voices can really make a difference? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Um, couple things. Um, first and foremost, if, if you feel anything, I think the first place is to actually stop and feel your feelings. Before you just jump into anything, stop and feel your feelings. Um, I'm a feel. I'm, I just advocate for that, right? Uh, feel that rage if you feel that. Feel that sadness. Feel that grief. Um, know what that feels like in your body, and then from there, actually center. And then, um, so resources, right? There are a lot of folks that um, organizations that I love um, that are really great. Uh, I named Dream Defenders a number of times. Um, mm -hmm. You can find them on Instagram. BYP100 is, uh, and I'm not just going to stay Florida specific. I know a lot of Florida specific organizations. I'm trying to think of like movement organizations um, that are not just in Florida, but really across the country. Um, I mentioned Southerners on New Ground. They're based in, in uh, Georgia, but I think they also have other chapters. Um, I'm thinking about... Uh, fight for 15, I'm thinking about, like, I, I mean, it depends on your issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, uh, there's the Poor People's Campaign, there's, um, uh, you know, there's movements, like, if your issue is affordable housing, like, what is, what is, what does that look like in your neighborhood? And I think my, my suggestion to folks is really to find those, those community leaders in your area, in your neighborhood, um, who are doing that work. Like here in Tampa, we have some really heavyweight greats like Connie Burton and, um, and Michelle Patty and Bishop, excuse me, Bishop Michelle Patty and like other folks who have been on, and Candy Lowe um, in, Ta in Palmetto, you know, you have like the Barbara Harveys and the, mm -hmm. you know, you have those like old heads. But also, um, you know, uh, I will also say not, because sometimes they can be a little respectable. But I think just being in community with those folks, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it. You know, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> they've um, been around the block. They've been around the block. You know, and, and, and respectability politics, to be clear, that's like that was our people's way of surviving. So I didn't exactly. cut the light on. I yeah. didn't realize it's getting a little bit darker here. Y'all can't see my face. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think finding those uh, groups online, and there are, like, uh, some popular activists as well who have been like Alicia Garza and Patrice Colors of the, of the and of Opal Tometi who created the um, who were behind Black Lives Matter. There are a lot of um, activists who have a large following on Instagram, on Twitter, who are literally like because people are asking like how do I get in? How do I? How do I? Where do I jump in? Find those folks in those pages. Those are great resources, not just because they have a large following, but because they actually have been on the ground themselves. And like that's why they know mm -hmm. these are the these are the folks that are doing the work that you probably want to do. Um, and I think you know uh, it's gonna cut us off, Devin, in twenty two seconds. Nope, it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also like uh, Miriam uh, Miriam Kaba has like a great resource around just again um if you want to get involved uh there's like four steps and i'll share it if that's helpful just just elaborating on the last point miriam uh kaba who has done a lot of abolitionist work is a great resource as well she's prison culture at prison culture online on twitter and uh uh i believe i don't know if she's on instagram but she has a, a great mm -hmm. meme that talks about four ways of how to help you start your journey into activism so just want to leave that okay 
And so before we head off, Devin, how can people find you? Because as I said before, you are a real life activist. And I was like, she's here, she's in the present, you know, and we're going to read about you someday. But how can people get in contact with you and just learn more about the work that you're doing in our home state? Yes, yes. Um, you can. So my handle on I have two Instagrams. This is my like personal activist one, Dev V Goat, D E V T H E E Goat, like Meg the Stallion, but I'm a Capricorn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also Dev V Goat on Twitter as well um, at Dev V Goat, and then on Facebook you can find me at Devin Cheese. Um, I would love for folks to go ahead and friend request me. We're doing some really exciting work here in Florida around uh, this, this program I'm working with called Path to Power, where we are literally building power here in Florida to be able to get liberation in our lifetimes. So um, definitely friend request me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. I also have a, a yogi page, Devi Asana OG. Um, so I will be doing more videos around yoga and breath work and stuff in the future, but yep, those are ways that you can plug in with me. Yes. All right, Devin. Well, thank you so much. This is, this has been so informative, not just, you know, on like the macro level, but also the things that have become on the micro level, you know, yeah. the girl, like I just, yeah. <laughs> felt like church. <laughs> yeah, girl, it's always, you know, that's, I feel like that's just, I, I was so looking forward to this conversation because that's how I feel like when we talk, it, it's just, the spirit just moves with us. So I appreciate you. Yes. Uh, likewise, you, you, you don't know. And we're going to talk after this. Like, likewise, it's just, it's always been just a good exchange and it's always been love and acceptance of wherever we were in a particular part of our life. And so to be able to come back and just to see you doing your thing, I'm always so proud of you. I can't give you enough likes and enough reactions on these social media platforms, but it's I'm rooting for you even if I'm not pressing a like in a particular moment because I'm doing something else. I'm always rooting for you. So thank you. I love you. And love just, you. Uh, just continue to do it, girl, because we need you. Yes, we need yeah. you. Yes, we need each other. We need you. Oh, my gosh. Ah, oh, Paul Yetta. Mm. All right. Yeah. I'm going to go cry in the corner now. <laughs> okay. Get the phone over there. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a good night then. You too, sis. Bye. All right. So that was another Divine Sacred Dialogue with my good friend Devin. Once again, it was about activism. And I want you all to join me next Thursday because I'm going to be doing the last Sacred Dialogue for the time being. And it's going to be about sacred womanhood. And so that's next Thursday. Go ahead and join me. Y'all have a good one.